And our second scripture comes to us from the book of James, from chapter 2, beginning at verse 1. James writes, My brothers and sisters, do you with your acts of favoritism really believe in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ? For if a person with gold rings and in fine clothes comes into your assembly, and if a poor person in dirty clothes also comes in, and if you take notice of the one wearing the fine clothes and say, have a seat here, please, while to the poor one you say, stand there, or sit at my feet. Have you not made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my beloved brothers and sisters, has not God chosen the poor in the world to be rich in faith and to be heirs of the kingdom that he has promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor. Is it not the rich who oppress you? Is it not they who drag you into court? Is it not they who blaspheme the excellent name that was invoked over you? You do well if you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, which is you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you show partiality, you commit sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become accountable for all of it. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith but do not have works? Can faith save you? If a brother or sister is naked and lacks daily food, and one of you says to them, Go in peace, keep warm, and eat your fill, yet you do not supply their bodily needs, what's the good of that? So faith by itself, if it has no works, is dead. The word of the Lord. This very passage from the book of James prompted the famous reformer Martin Luther to say, I almost feel like throwing Jimmy in the stove. That's what he called James, the author of the epistle. I almost feel like throwing Jimmy in the stove. That's what Luther had to say about this passage. And he was not the first to have concerns about it. There have always been concerns about this book of the Bible, and especially this part that we read is faith and works. But as we well know, that that concern, it boiled over with the Reformation in the 1600s. That was when uh, the, the concern started to really be laid out that maybe James is offering the opposite of Paul. We know Paul's fav- famous line, saved by grace through faith. And they said, how can James say what seems to be the opposite? Faith without works is dead. And so these concerns caught fire during that rallying cry of the reformers, which if you remember it, it was scripture alone, grace alone, faith alone. No works. In fact, anyone who said our works could save us was considered a heretic to the movement And so James was labeled the epistle of straw, and he was left on the back shelves to gather dust. We've had 400 years to do some thinking about this. And in all those years, we have noticed something about James. Perhaps he's not as contradictory as we thought. For many, many years, we thought he is an opposite to Paul, and both cannot be true. But maybe he's not as contradictory as we thought. For example, he never sets up a faith versus works scenario. He never says, for example, that we can choose to either have faith or do works, and one will be just as good as the other. He never says that. In fact, for him, works are not in competition with faith. Works are the completion of faith. Not competition, but the completion of faith. The only uh, competition James sees is this comparison of two kinds of faith, one that is alive and shows its own fruit, and one that is dead and shows nothing. That's what he wants to compare and contrast. 
Because James is not concerned about how faith starts. That's not his concern here. Paul is concerned about that. That's why when Paul writes, the only way to be made right with God, can it be done through works? No. Paul says the only way to be made right with God is through grace, the grace of God through faith. But James isn't worried about the start of faith. He's not worried about that day one. He's worried about the next day and the next week, and the next year, and the one after that, he is thinking about the ongoing life of faith. How do we know if it's alive? And James simply believes that if your faith has not changed you, then what good is it? If your faith has not changed you, what good is it? How is it going to save you today, tomorrow, next week, next year, if you can just stay the same as you are? There are some faiths that won't ask anything of you. There are a few. One of my personal favorites has become famous in the last 30 years. It is called Sheilaism. This is a real thing. You can Wikipedia it when you get home. Sheila-ism. And it came about from a book some gentlemen were writing on religion in America 30 years ago. And they interviewed a nurse named Sheila Larson. And they said, Sheila, tell us about your religious beliefs. And she said this. She said, I believe in God. My faith has carried me a long way. It's Sheila-ism. Just my own little voice. And then she went on to say that she bases her decisions and her choices in life on what does and doesn't feel right. Sheila opens the door to over 200 million new American religions, one for each of us. We get to have a a Johnism and a Bettyism and a Tashaism and all the ones we want. And not a single one would ask anything of us. Not a Bettyism, not a Johnism, not a Davidism, not a Tashaism, certainly, would ask nothing of us. All we would need to do is what feels right and trust our own little voice. But here's the thing. I have learned that I am completely untrustworthy. (laughs) You're supposed to laugh at that. But it's true. I I have learned I am completely untrustworthy. Uh, It hit me, it took me 35 years to realize I was completely untrustworthy. Here's the scenario. Go with me, if you will. You say to yourself, I'm going to go to the gym. And the little voice in my head says, oh, why? (laughs) You won't get anything out of it. It won't matter. You won't feel better. But then, the thing is about the little voice, if you do go to the gym, if you've ever experienced this, within five minutes, you know the little voice was wrong. You do feel better. It does matter. You are interested in doing this, but the kicker of the whole thing is, one would think that the very next time you have the opportunity to go to the gym, you would jump at it, right? What, what voice do you think I hear the very next time? The voice has never changed. <laughs> Not once. Even as evidence mounts to contradict it, the voice has never changed. It has to be ignored every single time. And I've learned that I do this with all kinds of things. At the end of a long day, I will consider, oh, should I call that friend and catch up? And here comes the little voice. No, you're too tired. No, you'll catch him at a bad time. No, it won't be relaxing. And if you do it, It turns out the little voice was a lie. I am completely untrustworthy. 
If it were up to me and I followed that little voice all the time, I would never move my body ever again, and I would never speak to anyone. This, this would be awful. <laughs> what would your life look like if you always followed that first little voice? What would your life look like if you always followed that little voice? Because James is pretty sure we're all the same in this way. He's pretty sure that our own little voice will not lead us home, it will lead us astray. He says, you know, there's that voice in us, it just seems natural to say about the poor, oh, they are leeches, I want to stay away from them. And we need Jesus' voice to shape us and reshape us and say, blessed are the poor, for theirs is the kingdom of God. And there is that voice that would say, we aren't worth anything. And we need the voice of Jesus to mold us, saying, even the hairs on your head, God has counted. And there is that voice that says we can't do anything in this world. We cannot make a difference. And the voice of Jesus is needed to pound us into shape and say, you are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. If you follow your own way, James says, if you follow your own way, a way that asks nothing of you, can that kind of faith save Can it save you? In the kind of faith that asks nothing of you, that demands no change, that lets you do what comes naturally, that has no fruit, can that kind of faith save you? It comes down to this. Do we believe that God's view for this world is the same as our view? For this world? Do we believe that they are completely in sync and intertwined, our view and God's view of this world? If we do, then we have no need of reshaping, no need of being molded and formed into something more like God wants. But if we don't believe they are, if we don't believe that they are always in line, our view and God's, then we need a faith that acts, asks us to believe differently, asks us to act differently. That's what James means by works when he talks about that. What he means is our works show that we are letting God reshape us. Will our works save us? No. But will listening to God's voice rather than our own little voice, will following God's voice rather than our own little voice, will that be our salvation? Yes. Yes. That's what he means by works. James takes as his focus something no congregation has ever encountered or had to deal with, how we handle the poor and the rich. He says, I've seen you, and when a rich person comes into your assembly, it is all, oh, please sit here, and oh, please do this, and when a poor comes into your assembly, it's, oh, please go away. He says, I understand it would be your natural inclination to do this. Our own little voice would tell us it feels right. But James is clear. God says, your little voice is wrong. In fact, God pushes to do the opposite of what feels right. The opposite. God honors the poor, and so you are not allowed to dishonor them, God says. God seeks out and meets needs, so you are not allowed to look away when you see one. If our faith is in God, then we cannot rely on our own intuition. For me, that's a good thing. (laughs) 
You've seen where I would lead my life. And so let's put it how it really is. If our faith is in God, then we get to not rely on our own intuition. We have to follow as best as we can what he says. And that following will make us act differently than we would naturally. This is a matter of life and death, this acting differently than we naturally would. Sheilaism or Tashaism or Billism, it won't ask anything of us, but it won't give any life either. It won't ask anything of us, but it won't give any life either. Left to our own devices, we are untrustworthy creatures who will always choose the way of death. The way of Jesus is the way of life. His way will not be our natural inclination. It will often not match the little voice in our head. Instead, faith in him will ask everything of us. It will ask everything of us. But in it, we'll finally be alive. Amen.